Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Wilson Center. My name is Marissa Khurma, and I'm the director of the Middle East program here at the Wilson Center. We are uh, delighted to be co-hosting this event with the Environmental Change and Security Program. Um, we've been working actually on this project for the last year plus, um, and it has been um, uh, delightful to host uh, many discussions over the course of the year with the agents of change, uh, youth, fellows, who are um, handpicked um, young people from the region working on all things related to climate change, um, security, as well as other themes that um, some of some of which you will hear today. So today um, we are also um, looking forward to um, hearing from Hussein Al Ghafari, who. Uh, is a representative from the Trade and Commercial Office at the United Arab um, Emirates Embassy here in Washington. Um, and we are grateful for the support of the UAE, UAE Embassy for this uh, fellowship uh, that um, uh, concluded in your country, in the United Arab Emirates, on the sidelines of COP28. So um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Hussein, to give um, a few opening remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm happy to say the embassy supported the agents of uh, Change Youth Fellowship, which aims to build experience and expertise amongst young professionals in the MENA working in fields related to climate change. And uh, it's good to see some of you again since we met this past December when we attended COP28 in Dubai. It was a busy but exciting two weeks, and I was inspired to see a lot of young people doing their part to address climate change. But a lot of work still needs to be done. Water scarcity is a serious issue for my country, the UAE's arid environment and location on the coast expose us harshly to the impacts of climate change. For that reason, we've always put a high value on conservation. For decades, our leadership has implemented policies to revitalize habitats, protect threatened species, and preserve nature. Today, the UAE is taking aggressive action and embarking on a major energy transition to meet the global climate challenge. The historic agreement to transition away from fossil fuels was a huge step. Beyond that, the UAE consensus also established targets to triple renewables and double energy efficiency by 2030. And it successfully operationalized the loss and damage fund to assist vulnerable countries. The diverse range of climate solutions at COP28 reflected the inclusivity of the conference. Beyond government to government engagement, civil society, women, youth, local leaders, faith-based communities, and indigenous peoples all had a platform. COP28 also engaged the private sector like never before, recognizing the impact business has on climate action. As COP President Dr. Sultan al Jabr said, the energy transition represents an enormous economic opportunity. Along those lines, the UAE joined with private equity firms to launch Altera, a $30 billion fund to invest in climate solutions. In all, there were $85 billion in new financial commitments to climate action at COP28. Notably, UAE-US cooperation remains essential to, go, to addressing climate change. Together, we are working on initiatives like Aim for Climate to make food production more sustainable, with investments now exceeding $17 billion. We are driving clean energy innovation with 11, um, soon to be 12 actually, most are renewable energy projects operating in the United States. We are protecting natural environments, such as the coral reefs in Florida. <clears throat> And an agreement with the U.S. for peaceful use of nuclear power is enabling the UAE to integrate zero-carbon nuclear energy into its grid. In addition, more and more U.S. companies are discovering the UAE as a place to scale their green businesses. While at COP28, I engage with CEOs and founders of U.S. companies that have relocated to the UAE to develop, manufacture, and scale their climate-friendly tech. Looking ahead, the UAE aims to build on the progress of COP by continuing to play a leadership role. With that in mind, the COP presidency launched a partnership with the next two hosts of the conference, Azerbaijan and Brazil. But no matter what happens at the governmental level, our greatest strength and our greatest hope are people like you, accomplished leaders who are working to build a more sustainable future. I look forward to hearing more about your work and discussing these important issues. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Hassan, and thank you for also um, being part of the um, fellows trip in Dubai. I know that you attended some of their presentations. Uh, so again, thanks to um, the UAE Embassy for their engagement and their support. Um, I'm happy to turn this over to my dear colleague, Lauren, um, who is the director of the um, Environmental Change and Security Program to facilitate this discussion today. Lauren, over to you. Thank you, Marissa, and let me echo Marissa's thanks, Hussein. It's, uh, this project, I think, represents sort of the best of the Wilson Center when we're able to work across our programs um, from our topical program, which is focused on the intersection of environment, uh, population dynamics, and security, and leverage the expertise and the insights of our regional program, uh, the Middle East program, to really take a deep dive into these issues in the particular context of the MENA region. Um, and I will say that this project um, has been a two-way exchange of insights, right? I think, um, I hope that the fellows will agree they, they uh, got a lot out of the project and their interactions with each other and with the experts that we um, were able to connect them with, but it was also incredibly insightful for us to hear about their research, their concerns, what questions they're asking, and where they're seeing opportunities for um, real progress on climate issues in the region. And so it's just, it's been a really incredible opportunity sort of all around, and I wanna um, thank the UAE Embassy um, and our fellows for their engagement with the project. Um, I also want to recognize Alex Farley and Claire Doyle, who really uh, held the reins of this project and made it work over the last year plus. So thank you very much for your leadership. Um, okay, so I'm going to introduce our speakers. Um, first, I want to clarify. So we have an online audience, and then we have an in-person audience. At the end of the session, we'll have about 20 or 30 minutes for questions and answers with the audience. And so for those of you in the room, when we come to that portion, please just raise your hands and then make sure to push the button on your microphone and speak into the microphone so that those watching online are able to hear you. And for those online, there is a box under the video that you are streaming where you can um, type in a question and send it our way. So please do take advantage of that. Um, okay, so first, let's see. I'm gonna introduce everybody at the front and then we'll go through. We're gonna hear from two of our fellows and then we're gonna hear from two long time experts um, in the region who are gonna reflect on their own research as it relates to the fellows, um, the fellows work. So first we're gonna hear from Gokche Shanchan, um, who is joining us from California. Gokche has worked on issues related to urban drought resilience, agriculture, the health impacts of climate change, and the energy water relationship. Gokche previously worked as an intergovernmental affairs intern at the United Nations Environment Program in New York and as a climate change research intern at Istanbul Policy Center. Her project focused on uh, the management of the Tigris-Euphrates River Basin in the face of climate change. Following Gokche, we'll hear from Noor Barake, who is an energy and communication consultant for the International Forum for Understanding. Noor is especially interested in the nexus of climate change, migration, and human rights. She has a Master of Arts in Public Administration from Central European University, where she focused on sustainable development goals and climate policy. She's also an accomplished playwright aiming at post-conflict peace building, which I think is always, it's always uh, adds for a richer conversation when we're able to include the arts in these discussions. Her project focused on renewable energy as a way to support sustainable energy security in Syria, um, particularly through the manufacture of, uh, of solar panels. Following our fellows, we'll hear from Dr. Marwa Dowdy, who is a Wilson Center scholar in residence this year, although not today. Um, she's joining us remotely. Uh, uh, when she's not at the Wilson Center, she's an associate professor of international relations at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and the Saif Gobash Chair in Arab Studies at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. Uh, Marwa has researched and written extensively on issues of water, migration, climate, and conflict in the Middle East, including Syria in particular, um, and has a range of publications, including um, the Water Weaponization and the Syrian Conflict, Strategies of Domin Domination and Cooperation, and what is climate change, framing risks around water, food, and migration in the Middle East and North Africa. And her work has been extremely useful to us here at the Wilson Center, understanding the complex interactions of these issues. And finally, we'll hear from Natalie Koch, who is also a Wilson Center Fellow and a professor of geography at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship 
and Public Affairs. She's a political geographer who works on geopolitics, authoritarianism, identity politics, and state power in hydro hydrocarbon rich countries, particularly in the Arabian Peninsula. And she has published extensively in journals such as Political Geography, Geoforum, Geopolitics, and Historical Geography, and is editor of the new book, Spatializing Authoritarianism. So we'll have some really interesting commentary following our presentations. So first, let's go to Gokche. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I will share my screen because I have a very short presentation uh, to highlight the findings of my paper. Uh, um, can you see the screen? Yes. In the room? Great. Um, so my paper was on uh, managing scarcity in the age of climate change, focusing on the Euphrates Tigris Basin, uh, with a particular focus on the relationship between Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. Um, and to give you a brief introduction to what's been going on in the Middle East in terms of climate changes, so the Euphrates Tigris Basin has already been facing multiple issues, uh, including water logging, which is basically oversaturation of the ground that can sometimes cause water uh, quality issues. Um, on top of that, pollution, uh, you might have heard that, but um, there was also a recent like disaster in Turkey that uh, caused um, the release of certain chemicals uh, into the uh, rivers, which has been an issue. Um, but in addition to that, there has been also already like ongoing pollution issues um, due to, you know, like water treatment, um, et cetera, and industrial activities throughout the basin. Um, high salinity has been causing a problem, especially when it comes to drinking water supply for the countries. Um, ecosystem degradation, you might have seen the alarming news about the wetlands in um, southeastern Iraq. Um, so that's already been an ongoing issue, um, also due to you know pollution. Uh, including like dam building and like other ecosystem degrading activities in the basin. And um, on top of all of that, uh, there has been already high water stress in Iraq and Syria in terms of, you know, like human right to water and humans needs for water um, to continue their daily lives. And high water stress is also anticipated in Turkey uh, in the next 20 years. And with all of these issues, we are also seeing very alarming projections in terms of climate change, which include uh, losing up to 60% of the current snow water availability, which means that the Euphrates Tigris Basin is losing its snowpack. Um, it's supposed it's um, projected to lose up to 55% of the river flows as well, uh, which will cause a significant strain uh, in terms of water supply throughout the region. And the snow melt, which is important in terms of timing for agriculture in particular, uh, might shift up to one month earlier in the year because the snow will melt faster due to the overall temperatures increasing and the risk of um, early summer spring heat waves also increasing. And more problems on top of all these like supply issues and timing issues are expected to cause uh, due to cascading effects of climate change, which will be, you know, for example, food insecurity uh, linked to lower agricultural yields due to disruptions to the water supply, uh, public health and sanitary risks, again, due to diminishing supplies, uh, but also the ongoing pollution problems that have already been impacting the region. Uh, and when combined with other factors, possible economic losses, increase in unemployment, higher living costs for everyone throughout the basin. So these are basically the problems that are already facing the region. And the challenges that Turkey, Syria, and Iraq do not have a management framework for the basin that would um, help you know, share the resources in an equitable way and in a way that can be adaptive to climate change and the changing uh, landscape in the basin. And some of the challenges that I listed here are the main barriers of to this co cooperation. One is Turkey's upstream advantage, meaning Turkey is controlling the headwaters of the basin, so it can control the flows, and it has a pretty extensive dam network um, on the rivers as well. So Turkey can control the releases. Um, and in the past, that has been a main point of conflict, especially in times of um, droughts. 
There are also very fundamental disagreements over hydrologic assumptions on the river, whether they should be treated as two different rivers versus just one river system. Um, disagreements over legal assumptions, um, some of them due to historical disputes in terms of, you know, like how the river waters used to be shared um, and, you know, arguments made by Iraq and Syria being that, you know, they have a historical right to the river supplies that should be equal to Turkey's um, because in the past they've been able to use it that way. Um, lack of trust due to various factors, but including also including water, but, you know, if you're familiar with the region, you'll you can already understand uh, why you know like Turkey and Syria wouldn't trust each other versus Iraq and Syria or Iraq and Turkey, um, and lack of data, or at least as far as we know, because in some cases there is genuine lack of data, and in some cases the countries refuse to share data publicly uh, because they don't want it to be weaponized against them uh, in these water dialogues. So these are very fundamental challenges. Um, but the need for a management framework is pretty urgent because the current system is unsustainable. For example, uh, in the past five, six years, Iraq has to has had to ask Turkey three times at least um, to release more water due to ongoing supply issues. So this is just not sustainable for a country to keep going back to the upstream country and basically pleading with them to release more water for very like you know basic needs. Um, there's too much uncertainty and elevated risk for conflict, even for Turkey, which might at first glance seem at an advantageous position because Turkey has been trying to establish itself as a regional leader uh, and an economic powerhouse, but um, it has to maintain good ties with the region as well. And it can't really afford um, any conflict, any internal conflict that might emerge even beyond its borders um, because Conflict in one region, one one country or one particular region within a country always has the risk of um, spreading. And this also means risk to governments, regional security and stability. And of course, very fundamentally, the well-being of millions of people who depend on this river system um, in terms of livelihood, in terms of you know basic needs. Um, so what I um, offered in my paper, and I will go into the details of all of these points in the paper as well, is um, there needs to be first three principles as the main pillars of this framework. One will be the equitable and adaptive distribution of both risk rewards, uh, you know, taking into consideration past use, uh, taking into consideration the future supplies. Um, on top of that, scientific and diplomatic transparency you know, instead of treating water as a pawn uh, in other negotiations or other uh, ongoing conversations, the countries should understand that water is a water is fundamental to the well-being of every single person living in the basin. And um, without scientific data, without vast collection of data data sets, they won't be able to make very um very effective decisions in the basin as a whole. And the countries need to understand that the new uncertain climate reality and scarcity uh, makes some of their past demands or past uh, requirements for coming to the table um, unattainable because it's just there's not just going to be enough water um, as much as they want. Um, so what I offered was um, trilateral organizational structure that would um, basically manage the basin uh, that will be on, based on consensus. Uh, it will be based on three levels of um, committees. One will be the high level decision council, which will be a more, as, a, as the title says, a high level uh, at the more you know political level maybe. And there will be equal representation, but also consensus based decision making. And they will work in collaboration with a trilateral science committee uh, with scientists from all three countries uh, nominated in various ways or like accepted in different ways um, who will provide the scientific data, including climate projections, hydrological data, annual water availability based on how much rain or snow the region received in a given year. And also, you know, taking into consideration the basin's ecosystem needs. Um, trilateral planning committee will 
work on you know budgeting the water for human needs, agriculture, uh, water demand analysis and management, pollution tracking, um, planning for disasters, you know, such as like ecological disasters, natural disasters, um, and also trying to identify opportunities for more water efficiency projects, for more, um, you know, like transnational projects to increase, you know, water efficiency or storage opportunities. Um, and these three committees will work in conjunction with each other and they will be in constant communication. And um, again, going back to the challenges, they're not very easy to overcome, but there have been examples in the um, rest of the world where you know other countries were able to come to the table and um, reach an agreement over water use, which I can also talk about uh, during the Q&A. But this is it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Gokche. Now we'll go to Noor on uh, her, her project focused on solar power in uh, Syria. Noor, please. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Gokche. Also, I, uh, this is not the first time to hear about your paper, but I'm always uh, impressed. And it's uh, perfect laying the ground for my uh, project as well, since you mentioned all of the vulnerability regarding climate change in the region. And my project is specifically about Syria as part of uh, the region as well. Uh, so my paper is about enabling sustainable energy security in Syria, deals with three different aspects of the issue at stake, socioeconomic, humanitarian, and environmental considerations. Mainly the project, as mentioned uh, by Lauren, is to manufacture solar panels in Syria. As a context uh, specific in Syria, the conflict has imposed severe uh, challenges on the country's energy sector, especially the electricity sector, impacting daily life, livelihoods, the economy, <clears throat> excuse me, and humanitarian aid operations. The scarcity of oil and natural gas has made it harder to meet electricity demands. And in this context, the uh, solar panels use of them has emerged has, has emerged as an alternative, uh, especially on the household level. But their highly costs render them inaccessible to those with limited income. In addition to the imbalance, imbalance power dynamics in trade, which further exacerbated the situation. So against this backdrop, uh, um, one avenue for much needed renewable energy development and for the green transition to mobilize the humanitarian sector in the short run to support the manufacture of solar panels in Syria. Such an intervention would provide immediate relief, first of all, for individual households and create job opportunities while addressing the long run, the long term social, socioeconomic and migratory challenges in the region. Now I'm going to give some examples of how this insufficient access to electricity feeds humanitarian crisis. Uh, the electric power sector in Syria has faced significant uh, problems due to the impact of war, which has included attacks on the critical infrastructure, oil and gas facilities, power plants, and electricity transmission and distribution networks. An economic blockade also in the country exacerbated these issues. As a result, the availability of primary energy resources uh, decreased drastically, dropping from 24 million tons of oil uh, equivalent in 2011 to approximately 10 in 2021. Of course, the demand uh, for electricity will rise and ensuring access to electricity in Syria is also a vital humanitarian concern in the context of ongoing conflict. The 2022-2023 humanitarian response plan includes plan to enhance the availability of energy resources within community Furthermore, the provision of energy system increasingly integrated into early recovery and resilience efforts throughout the HRP. Now, to, to provide an assessment uh, to the current and future demand, demands, I provided some case studies uh, on different uh, level from different sectors in the paper. One of which is if we talk about the demands that is current and in the future from the government um, side, the Syrian Ministry of Electricity, especially in their uh, strategy in the report to 2021 for uh, increasing energy efficiency and also uh, use of usage of uh, renewable energy, suggested so many different projects among them uh, developing solar power uh, plants. 
uh, also from the non-governmental uh, or the areas where uh, the, the government is not in control, such as in the northern of Syria, such one of the largest medical aid NGOs um, called the UOSSM envisions a future which every hospital in the country relies on clean and abundant solar, solar energy. We already implemented a lot of projects in that regard. From the investor uh, or uh, private sector uh, side, um, example of some companies, especially from uh, the UAE companies, are set to establish significant uh, power plants, solar power plant in Damascus countryside in 2024. And from the humanitarian sector, the United Nations uh, Development Program, UNDP, has launched a vital electricity and uh, energy support project in Syria. In addition to all of this, Syrians' ongoing crisis remains a significant driver to the world's largest displa displacement crisis, with far-reaching consequences for both humanitarian and development efforts. Notably, ecological degradation and climate disruption has emerged as an influential factor, uh, have in, uh, influential factors shaping the response of this crisis in the uh, in the hosting countries as well. So, how how could that be done? The, the recommendations for such a project actually is initially to fund solar panel investment throughout uh, through humanitarian aid. This approach should be limited to five to seven years before transitioning to international direct investment, allowing for the participation of Syrian investors. Also, to make solar panel funding inclusive, and this is one of the main pillars of this uh, project, on both uh, political inclusion when it comes to the divisions within the country and the areas under and non, uh, not under the uh, control of the government, and also social uh, in inclusive. Uh, so the project envisioned uh, that it should aim to be non-political, serve all Syrian areas and citizens without discrimination, providing free access to clean energy for also the poorest segments of the population. Now, since this project has two elements or two parts, one is uh, non-profit and one is profit. So use the profits from the humanitarian, for the humanitarian purpose. So the profits from selling the products actually to governmental and non-governmental organizations and to the private sector should be used to cover the humanitarian non-profit aims of the project, including supply, individual households, and most importantly also to the humanitarian aid organizations. And finally, develop uh, training programs. Um, the project manufacturers should collaborate, especially with the, uh, the UNDP, design training programs in renewable energy, including in manufacture, installation, and maintenance of solar power systems, and encourage, of course, gender equality and women's participations in all areas of the program. Now, there's still two, this is in general, there's still two issues I would love to uh, address, but maybe later on also in, in the sessions, mainly when it comes to the climate finance, uh, talking about the outcome now of the COP28 uh, uh, and how that would work uh, in the context of uh, such complex political situation in Syria and that how that contributes actually to the energy security and the other issues very vital to this, uh, to this project to be implemented and to be inclusive is the ownership issue. And this is also something of the importance of the comprehensive approach when it comes to humanitarian aid, development aid, including also the climate targets when it comes to climate action. So for now, I will stop here and maybe we'll continue in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Noor. And I, I think there's like two things that sort of stand out from across both of your presentations. Um, one of that being how uh, thoughtfully you both looked at the broader context in which climate change is interacting, right, and pulled out some of the, the vulnerabilities that exist with or without climate change and how climate change is going to sort of compound um, those, those issues and how our responses need, need to be responsive to that. Um, but then also both of your um, sort of proposals, I feel like they, they build on a lot of the, the research and the insights that have come out over the last decade or two, right, and the successes that we've seen elsewhere. And so they're, 
they're, they have a foundation of like, here's what has worked elsewhere. Here are some innovative ideas that we can apply to these contexts. And, and I think that's uh, having, having that broader context is really important and valuable. So thank you both. Uh, Marwa, I'm gonna turn it over to you for your reflections. So I, I first want to commend our two uh, authors, uh, Agents of Change, for writing such a thoughtful, extensively researched, and well-articulated papers. And as you mentioned, Lauren, they managed to really link what was happening domestically in Syria, but also regionally, to the geopolitical context, to issues of climate change, and how access to water and, and food and um, electricity energy uh, is uneven, is divided domestically in Syria. And Noor, you do a very good job at showing how the fragmentation of Syria also implies injustice in terms of access to electricity for a lot of the population. One could add access to clean water as well. We know that 90% of Syrians don't have access to water today, clean water, because of the war. And this is a lingering legacy of the war. And Goche, you also show how the state of the relations between the riparian states is very important in determining who has access to the waters of these international rivers and who doesn't have. And I think this is very important in understanding that there are climate change impacts, but this is also what the policymakers make out of these you know, impacts and what policies they implement. And the politics of it, as you mentioned, is very important. Um, I, I think um, the economic prosperity and the human security very much depends on all of the issues that you outline. And I think beyond all of that, uh, we're talking about environmental security, human security, livelihoods, and uh, post-war recovery, but also uh, equitable sharing of shared water resources between the three riparians that you were mentioning. Um, I think in terms of also the impacts of the war, um, the weaponization of the resources is also a factor that you include in your, um, in your papers. Uh, Gokce, you mentioned that the water agreement between Syria and Turkey in 1987 was part of a security protocol. And more specifically about the Kurdish issue, right? About Syria's support to the PKK. And, and for Noor's paper as well, uh, how the conflict has created this, this divide, this crisis, humanitarian crisis, and how the fragmentation of Syria also calls for different actions, because you mentioned the Syria Recovery Trust Fund, which is able to cater to the Northwest and the Northeast, which are outside of government control, and what the Syrian government does. This raises the issue also of what could be done by these actors when there is financing coming into the country the issue of corruption and also the issue of who gets what. And again, a human insecurity issue. And to go back to the weaponization, I think it's important also to outline uh, how much also there is, there's been in the case of the Syrian conflict also deliberate targeting of water infrastructures as a tool of war. And we have the striking news now of the war in Gaza where there's also deliberate targeting of water infrastructures by Israel, which is really putting in line that climate change impacts are highly political, and you both do very well in showing the geopolitics of climate change. And I want to commend you uh, on that, and we'll, I'll have more thoughts later on. Thank you. Thank you, Marwa. And now we'll come back to the room and hear from Natalie. And you were, you were recently at the at COP28, and so it'd be helpful to have your reflections on how you saw these issues reflected in the discussion there and, and what has come out of the discussion today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I'm, I really appreciated the presentations. I didn't have a chance to read them, but I'm happy to offer some thoughts. Also because this topic is uh, something I've been working on, not just in the Middle East, but also in the US Southwest. Um, I'm from Arizona, where we have a lot of similar water problems. And in fact, that's actually where I wanted to start with my comments on um, 
Gokcha's paper is that it, it reminded me of a lot of the challenges that are happening with the Colorado River water negotiations. And this is within the United States. This is a, a, a state uh, issue. And we, we see a lot, I think, in terms of the possibilities for your um, trilateral organization with that sort of high-level decision-making body, and you have representatives for each state in the U.S. Southwest that are working on these negotiations. Uh, but even last year, when the, uh, th there were just some extreme uh, low water levels that that hit a hit a critical point it came to it came to be that the federal government had to essentially step in and so that that was sort of when, when you were talking about this uh, type of body it struck me as something to to ask like how would you imagine a, a higher power perhaps that that could deal with uh, some of these challenges if the negotiators are just hitting an impasse um, what other sort of diplomatic channels might there be for that, and in what system would this be embedded? Uh, that that was one uh, big question that I had. And the, the other thing that sort of had me thinking about the U.S. Southwest is that you have uh, cross-border uh, water issues between the United States and Mexico. And often when we focus about focus on these water issues, we talk about surface water. But surface water is also an issue related very strongly to groundwater. And so there are some shared aquifers between uh, the United States and Mexico, as, as well as many other parts around the world. Um, what it, to what extent does groundwater factor into this? Um, would that become a key part of this discussion? And, and I ask this also because as surface waters dry up, more and more places around the world are starting to tap into those underground water supplies. Uh, and I think that could be a, a really important uh, essential element uh, to your discussion if, it, if it's not already built in there. So sorry in advance if, if uh, you've, you've already touched on that. Um, but of course, at COP, the water, water was one of the big themes, um, and, and I think there, again, you, you did s still see that, that focus on surface water as opposed to groundwater, uh, but this is an issue that we really can't uh, ignore. Um, all right, and then quickly on to uh, Nora's paper. I, I also really appreciated this because I, I also think a lot about solar in desert environments, and I, I think your, um, your, your research really emphasizes the importance of that. I think when when people imagine desert solar projects, they're often thinking about utility scale. And so I think what you do is you sort of decenter that and say, look, this is actually about ordinary people. This is that that, that sort of microgrid imagination of how you could use and implement solar projects. Uh, so so I think that's that's quite impressive and important. Um, one question that I had, and, and something I, I've seen only one or two academic articles that ask this question, which is, what is all of this renewable energy for? Um, we, we sometimes for, forget that. But I think that the, at the moment that you say what that energy is for, then that can help you sort of target who, who it is that might fund these types of projects, what kind of projects might they be. Um, and here I'm also thinking about this because there's a lot of projects within the sort of uh, solar power and uh, agricultural technology sector around agrivoltaics. So is this, so, is this solar power for some Thing that could help with agriculture. So you have the um, solar panels over then a, 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 a ag tech installment, like a big shipping container that's converted to be a little greenhouse. Um, that's one direction for it. I have another colleague who I, I saw at COP in Dubai recently as well. She's been working on these microgrids uh, to distribute these very, very small um, initiatives in Africa, and she ties that in with school and the, those sort of possibilities for to bringing that in with education. Um, and so this is just a, a small point to say, what, who, what is the solar power for? I, I think is a really important question and can help us sort of tailor that discussion uh, in, in a really great way. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so let me go back to Gokche first to see if you have um, uh, any responses to Marwa and Natalie's comments. Um, in particular, Natalie had a question about the, like, how would uh, the, your proposal, how would you deal with like a potential for an impasse, right, in decision making, which is something that we have seen here in the U.S. Um, and then the, the focus on groundwater, which is very often excluded from water security discussions. Yeah, um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, 
that's a, the first question is something that's puzzled me for quite some time, uh, even before I started writing this paper. Um, it's it's the main challenge of international relations, right? All of these countries are independent from each other. And I, I actually did look into the Colorado River. Um, also, I'm quite familiar with the challenges in the Colorado River Basin, too. And even in the presence of a federal government, you know, the states couldn't come to an agreement. So the federal government had to step in. In the case of uh, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, the situation is even more complicated because Turkey is highly suspicious of any external um, interference, uh, any you know intervention by a third party um, because of some past issues due to you know funding and um, Syria and Iraq kind of like trying to target the uh, fund um, sources uh, for dam projects in Turkey. So um, and in the opposite side, uh, Syria and Iraq really want another party to step in and intervene and like you know kind of guide the negotiations um so that makes it even more challenging to bring in third party um something i thought about is and i kind of like heard the possibilities around this too is the united nations has been actually thinking about um I think they've been like thinking about and planning to maybe somehow get involved in the process, maybe as a facilitator, as a, you know, like neutral party. And, you know, in the lack of a global federal government, I guess is what I would say, um, United Nations seems like the best next best next best option. Um, as for the, as for groundwater um challenges there is also groundwater challenges especially in syria and iraq because in the lack of water from euphrates and tigris they have to start like pumping more groundwater and some of it is political some of it is completely out of need um you know due to some pretty severe droughts um uh, especially in the early 2000s um i would say our best bet at also addressing the groundwater situation in the countries is if you can have an agreement and if there is a level of trust, there's actually a lot of potential for joint projects in terms of groundwater recharge where, you know, like Turkey can release excess water downstream for Syria and Iraq to recharge it and like store it underground, uh, which can then be returned to Turkey in terms of, you know, like in another year, Syria and Iraq doesn't demand as much water. But again, these countries don't trust each other. so. How 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 would they even like operate such a program? You know, there's there's no body that will be independent from the governments of these three countries that will be responsible for tracking, maybe monitoring, maybe making sure the you know terms of the agreements are met. And without building trust first and addressing very uh, fundamental questions about you know like how these three parties can come to the table, it's pretty difficult to you know even imagine the implementation of such a project. Um, one thing I would say is, in the case of the Mekong River, which is also a similar case to the um, Euphrates and Tigris, is Mekong River also has a bunch of downstream countries, but the headwaters are within the boundaries of China. And China didn't want to, you know, come to the table in terms of the other downstream countries basically negotiating an agreement. However, over the years, after the downstream countries started collaborating more and more with each other, which I felt like was an international situation of FOMO, fear of missing out, China also started to contribute a bit more to the discussions, you know, started to get a bit more involved in the process, even though they're still an observer, not a party to the Mekong River um, Commission. But they're still, they're trying to somehow participate and maybe, you know, it's also in their best interest to be involved in these negotiations, right? To seem like a, you know, good faith negotiator, a good faith neighbor. Um, so something that could be tried is somehow Iraq and Syria trying to maybe resolve their own differences first and then try to manage the water on their own and with the intervention of a neutral third party, possibly bringing Turkey to the table. But yeah, it is a it is a tough situation, very unbalanced in terms of, of power dynamics. Thank you, Gokce. Marwa, this is a space that you have spent a lot of time thinking about. I wonder if we could turn to you for any reflections. 
Yes, thank you, Lauren. Uh, I actually wrote my first book on the uh, negotiations between Syria, Turkey, and Iraq around the Euphrates and Tigris waters. And interestingly, um, you mentioned in your paper that Turkey is described as a hegemon, being upstream, being able to turn the tap whenever it decides. Uh, there's one aspect in the paper that I, saw, I, I thought was missing is that you don't mention the great Anatolian project that Turkey is building and has been building since the 1970s with the Keban, but then it started officially in the 80s. And that project eventually will lead to the cut of 70% of the Euphrates and 40% of the Tigris. So Turkey is in a position where it claims sovereignty over the waters. And it's interesting the link with the Colorado River because the Harmon Doctrine in, in international law, which says that a state which is upstream like America could do whatever it wants, is outdated today. Today, we're moving on to um, equitable and reasonable utilization between riparians. And Turkey has tweaked this by saying, well, equitable and rational, not really abiding by international water law. So I think there could be an impasse, but what Syria did was to securitize water. To its support to the Kurdish brought Turkey to an agreement. And this is the short term, not sustainable strategy. But it's interesting also to know that all of these riparians have been meeting in the Joint Technical Committee for over 30 years, exchanging data, et cetera. But as soon as the process is politicized, it goes to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, then you don't have the, uh, an agreement. And I think your point about a management framework, what you're actually calling for is a basin-wide agreement, which Turkey is resisting because it's upstream and it wants to continue its gap project. How do we get to the basin-wide agreement? Well, clearly third parties, but also uh, there's grassroots campaigns, which have, uh, you mentioned the Bira Chik Dam, the Ilisu Dam campaign has been very effective by grassroots activists because that dam was scheduled to flood a very important historical city, Hassan Kayf. And because of the campaign worldwide, Turkey had to move the site of the dam on the Tigris River. So possibly grassroots campaigns, environmental campaigns could be a way also of pressuring hegemons, upstream countries, in addition to third parties. I don't know, what do you think about that uh, possibility? Of, of you know action and influence. Gokche, did you Should want we... to respond? Sorry. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were like. Yeah. Um, so, grassroots has a lot of potential, and actually, one of the strategies that I proposed that could be implemented is the ability of people living in downstream countries to be able to object uh, object to upstream projects or you know kind of have a say in how these projects are implemented um you're right i actually had to cut the grand anatolian project because of vert limitations uh but that was something i also looked into um kind of like beginning at, at the beginning of my project um it is, again, it is challenging and securitization can also have a downside to it sometimes because if the matter which was used to securitize water is also difficult to solve and kind of dividing and like, you know, just not getting parties to kind of like get on starting to talk about uh, the matter, then it becomes even more difficult. But on the other hand, could be advantageous too. Um, one of the challenges I kind of explored while re writing the paper was um, sometimes when the negotiations kind of stay at the water, like the quantity of the water level too, you know, if the matter is only about volume, how much water do these parties get? That also brings the conversation, the negotiations to a halt because of inflexibility and, you know, when things start to kind of get on the more concrete side of this much volume, this much water. And if it's not adaptive due to the changing reality, the annual variability of the water system, then the countries are a bit more likely to object uh, to certain water numbers. Um, so That's why yeah. the, the consensus here is about percentages yeah. versus volumetric allocations and to take into account climate change. But to lock still the countries into a minimal agreement through percentages would be a way to think about your term about being adaptive. Yeah. So, yeah. Nor, do you want to respond to Natalie's question about uh, what the renewable energy provided 
buy the solar panels at sort of that high, high I'm sorry, household or microgrid level, who, what, what that would be for, the purpose? Uh, yes, thank you. This is also one of the questions I was uh, thinking about. It's very important, uh, again, in this in this conflicted, uh, complex political situation to think about, uh, again, the power dynamics, talking about the power dynamics. And when, when we talk about grid, any any entity would start feeding into the grid. That means, again, the question of who controls what, who will provide for whom, and in which area. Are we talking about only the governmental or non-governmental, who has access to these entities? So it is still possible, and uh, one of the, the issues to work around this, it was actually, uh, now I can come to, to the point of the ownership. The way that this project is going to be implemented is actually based on uh, the approach of uh, development aid uh, was uh, mentioned in the Paris Declaration, but was the least favorable, actually, uh, uh, approach, because later on we adopted and it was recommended by the Declaration that uh, development aid should be more to give um, the country the, uh, the ownership, so the country ownership, so for the national sovereignty and to develop um, uh, independency in the future from the aid, uh, which is, of course, makes sense in many uh, other cases. Uh, but again, here in, in the situation in Syria, given the fragmentation, what uh, Dr. Mawa also talk, talked about, it's not possible to, uh, to, uh, to avoid the politicization and uh, uh, weaponization of aid, which we also saw after very clearly, unfortunately, after the earthquake that hit both Syria and Turkey and how that was um, immediately uh, recognized that it's not go going to work this way. Uh, so the approach to this development aid is actually a, the, the older version, which is uh, for the donor to have actually ha the higher say. They set the standard. They, uh, according, of course, to the humanitarian and international law, they said the uh, they set the targets and they have a very strict monitoring um, um, body to continue and to monitor the whole implementation especially to in, ensure no harm and anti-corruption, which is one of the biggest pro problems that we, we face in Syria, and to ensure uh, transparency. So uh, this is what it's called the direct control of the donor. And that's why, again, this is a work around the uh, uh, deadlock politically. Um, so coming back to how this will uh, this will influence then dealing with uh, UNDP uh, within Syria and with other organizations work directly with these uh, projects and feeding into the grid. In this case, we can actually, so or, or the implementation of these implementers of this project can ensure that uh, this product could be bought by governmental, non-governmental, private sector, and to, to plan together for uh, feeding into the grid. But uh, the more feasible uh, one, uh, like approach to go and what is this project is basically was about is kind of urgent solution to the household level. That's why it's to provide these products immediately as humanitarian aid, and um, to, uh, to to work also on the microgrid uh, solutions as well. So that would be the case to go in order to ensure again uh, the, uh, to avoid the difficulties in the political uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you, Noor. We have about uh, a little bit more than 20 minutes left, so I want to go ahead and open the discussion up to questions from the audience, um, and then I have additional questions that I can sneak in there if an opportunity comes up. But let's start with here in the room. So we'll take a couple questions, so get ready. We're going to start with just this gentleman over here. And please uh, just introduce yourself, please. Steve Jackson. I'm a fellow here at the uh, Wilson Center. Uh, and. Uh, um, I'm very interested in this uh, piece, particularly Goche's uh, uh, work on uh, um, the, the uh, Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, and I'm just uh, uh, suggesting that there's another analogy that might be in there that involves China, which is my main uh, research is on China and its water relations. And the Mekong is the famous one. Uh, we all know about that. But there are two rivers that flow into Kazakhstan, the Ili and the Irtish, uh, which also have the same kind of uh, 
securitized imperative domestically. That is, just as Turkey has the GOP program to try to improve things in the Kurdish areas, uh, China has the Great Western Initiative, which is going to improve things in Xinjiang for the Uyghurs. Um, and this is one of the reasons why China doesn't want to share more water with downstream Kazakhstan and further downstream Russia, or even go into a trilateral discussion, is because they see that water as essential to holding on to Xinjiang and improving things there, just as there is this Kurdish issue in the Great Anatolian uh, project in, uh, uh, in Turkey. And so I think there's another analogy. Unfortunately, it's an analogy that doesn't you know, give much optimism. China hasn't shared more water with Kazakhstan, even though Sino-Kazakh relations are pretty good. Uh, and it, uh, you know, they see it as their water. As uh, Amaro pointed out, this is sovereign water. This is China's water. We're not going to give it to you uh, if we have a greater demand for it. Thank you, Steve. That's an interesting comment. Uh, any other questions here in the room? Please. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Vetter with the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Thank you so much for this really interesting conversation. Um, you mentioned social inequality and gender was briefly brought up, but I'd love to hear more elaborating on in your research what you've seen as gender barriers in the region as far as resource access for women and girls and what can be done more to bridge this in policy and practice. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Uh, that is a question that I know everybody on this panel can speak to at length. Um, does anybody want to go first? Then I will just go ahead and pick on somebody. Marwa. Uh, <laughs> Are you sure? Okay. I thought I thought Noor would know more, but um, that, that ties to another question I had, which is about gender gap. Yeah. but also the inequity for the internally displaced. And we know that women, internally displaced women, have the double penalty also of being impacted by climate change, but also the political context, right, of displacement, et cetera. And I think um, there's been a lot of studies about the uneven and uh, impacts of climate change on women and girls uh, in remote areas. We know the rural communities are specifically impacted and women and girls are pillars of these communities. And when there is water scarcity, as uh, Noor's paper also mentions, and energy uh, scarcity, uh, it's even more of a weight and a burden for these girls and women uh, who are pillars of the communities to go and fetch the water means walking out, uh, going not going to school for the girls, um, and, and missing out on education. And I think also in the case of displacement, and I would love to hear Noor on that because you work on migration as well, and the links with climate change, uh, there's another underlying and invisible impact here, which is not only within women's communities, but also internally displaced communities in Syria. And I know that there were some solar panels given to the Syrian refugees in some of the hosting countries, like Jordan elsewhere. And perhaps you can tell us if you see that happening also within Syria. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry, Lauren, I'm sending nope, over that's the good. question you set, you. you set Nora up very nicely. Um, and I would add, Nora, your paper, you, you, you do also talk about the um, disruption uh, to healthcare services, right? And so, and we know that for women and girls, just the access to basic uh, reproductive healthcare services um, is, a, is key to their being able to have... Um, uh, the sort of decision-making power and being able to have that that sort of empowerment that allows them to uh, to help more broadly in communities. Uh, so why don't you, Mara primed you very well. Do you want to comment on the question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's it's actually different in different settings. So when we talked about uh, the IDPs and in hosting, uh, let's say, as people who just dis were displaced from city to another city, uh, which happened a lot inside Syria, and we have a lot of these uh, situations, and there's the displacement to camps, and these are two different settings, and um, especially when it comes to the access to health uh, and to uh, access, of, of course, to electricity, as you mentioned, also the example of uh, solar panels were, were distributed, in fact, in uh, several uh, locations in, in the camps, but that's not the case, of course, for the IDPs in other hosting uh, communities. And 
here uh, I would love to give an example which is a little bit optimistic about the settings of IGPs inside Syria. The, in general, the, 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 the whole disruption of the the moving around and being in contact with totally different cultures, even within the, the same society, of course, has its, of course, downsides and that uh, in, interrupted a lot of um, education uh, uh, processes uh, in, in time, at the time of moving and all of that. But now, since we are talking about the lingering conflict, and it's been years, so uh, actually the access of women and girls to both work and education within the hosting communities inside Syria, it's much higher than the access to in, in, in camps, unless we have specific projects that are taking care of that. Because in, in this new environment and the inter interchange that actually loosened a lot of what I consider one of the main obstacles towards um, development in that regard is the traditional, uh, uh, the traditions and the uh, regarding what is considered to be okay or not okay for a woman in, in society, and especially for some communities who are coming from the countryside and a total new setting of the city that was a total different um, uh, environment for them. Also, because unfortunately, a lot of men were, were then went to war when on each side of the conflict. So that again, it's not new. Uh, each war has provided, and it's like the upside, maybe there's no upside for war, but this is the one advantage that women just has more space, more space to go out, out of necessity, because they need to provide, they need, they are the one uh, head of the family. So women are, in fact, uh, are more involved in, in, the, in, in, in the work force and also to provide education for, for their girls. So this is the setting, again, in, in EDPs inside Syria, while when we talk about the uh, refugee camps, that's a total different issue. And here I want to highlight um, what at the beginning here we talked about the uh, private sector uh, businesses' role in the whole issue. Uh, here is another example. Camps are always considered to be a temporary place, and this is kind of what made most of the camps, a long history, a miserable place for people was always supposed to not even in many countries in many countries in Africa if I call uh, directly in Kenya there's been several camps that didn't have even running water and this is kind of a political or um, not a law but it's more like the norm of dealing with camps that we have some camps it's been 75 years <laughs> people living in there but no one wants to make kind of a permanent uh, enhancement to the situation this is where some of the very interesting projects that I've learned recently about coming from the private sector because they don't think they do, they overcome these barriers and just go further down further the road and implement what it needs to be implemented. And a company, um, an Austrian company, I think, um, of water supplies just went to the camps in Kenya and provided the running water. So suddenly uh, there is much better situation for these people and we overcome the what it's called the contemporary uh, camp situation in order to keep people wanting to, to return. And this is just simply not the way to, to go to. And this applies in so many different uh, aspects, including energy and including uh, specifically electricity. So yeah, that would be my remark on that. Natalie, did you want to comment on a question about gender? I have to say, I my my research largely focuses more on the tech sector, mm -hmm. and I think this this is maybe something where you could you could also look to some of the conversations in um, the at the COP uh, negotiations because there there were a number of different hubs, and of course there was a big uh, sector and section on climate innovation and and green tech, uh, where the the UAE has really like emphasized trying to bring women into green tech jobs uh, but of course that's that's a very different set of issues than than what Noor just so so beautifully uh, described but I think regardless it, it sort of emphasizes how these gender issues don't go away depending on what your class situation is what your migration situation is what your citizenship situation is um, that they're really sort of cutting across all of the sectors yeah. that's a great point yeah of course Marissa. here 
I think just, um, I think both Marwa and, and Noor um, outlined some of the challenges and um, just the impact on, you know, the, the different configuration of families and what they look like more, women-led households, how that changes the dynamics. But of course, um, as it becomes more and more difficult uh, to access uh, water in particular, and as Marwa mentioned, um, women and girls have to um, basically, you know, walk further, they put themselves more at risk as well to gender-based um, violence. And we've seen an uptick in uh, sexual violence in a lot of the displacement settings. Um, and in certain cases, uh, with families that are more comprehensive and intact, particularly in the refugee camps, we've also seen an uptick in child, um, uh, child marriage. Uh, because that's the, the the first thing that families think about to protect their girls. Um, and so uh, we've seen an increase in camps in Jordan as well as in urban settings and as well as in Lebanon and um, uh, in, in Turkey as well. So, so those are all, you know, that doesn't happen overnight, but of course a lot of these compounding um, issues um, impact the family and in most cases girls and women are um, at, at huge risk of sexual violence and child marriage. Thank you, Marissa, important point. Um, Gokhe, I'm gonna come to you, but I'm gonna also bring in a question that came in from online about um, migration. And so the question is, um, when thinking about managing water resources, one concern can be migration. Did your research look at migration as an effect or cause? And if so, what does this interaction look like? I would broaden it maybe to think about more, like just broader population dynamics, people, more people moving to the city, uh, people moving because of conflict impacts. Did you take that into consideration when you looked at this, the sort of different stressors on water availability in the region? Um, it was one of the things I was, at the back of my mind, even though it wasn't the primary focus, uh, just based on previous readings I've done in the area, and maybe you know, like this, this is uh, the paper that discussed this has been kind of speculative. So there have been a lot of debate around it. But um, one of the you know like cases that was made about the cause of the Syrian civil war was. Uh, its connection to the drought in the early 2000s and how that drought basically, you know, just ravaged the rural communities, deprived them of, you know, like income that would that would have come from agriculture. And the pattern that happens um, in terms of migration when a drought hits a region is, you know, agriculture is usually is one of the major industries that would fail um, or highly suffer. And farmers would need to create another income. So there will be a process of internal migration first. So it wouldn't be people just being like, I'm just going to move to another country because you know I can't uh, you know, like get any income from my fields anymore. That's not the first thought. The first thought is to go to the biggest, closest um, city center or the town. Um, and that could you know manifest itself in terms of rising living costs, housing costs, uh, rising cost of food because now there's more demand in a certain area, but less food available due to the drought. Uh, and this can sometimes take a few years to actually observe on the field. Um, and you know, when you think about it, this can all be connected to back to a drought that has been pretty severe, or you know, has been exacerbated by climate change factors. Um, so that will be the connection that I can build. But again, that paper that I mentioned about the uh, Syrian war has been, some people thought it was a pretty much a reach. Um, some people thought it had a valid ground, um, but it has been considered as one of the possibilities that might have contributed to the discontent among people uh, due to the, you know, like unemployment, rising cost of living, uh, rising cost of food. So. Thank you, Gokche. Marwa, do you want to comment on that? Mm -hmm. Actually, yes, thank you, Lauren. Uh, um, my last book was about the Syrian, the climate-driven thesis about the Syrian conflict, and I actually debunked it in my book. So I do think environmental insecurity matters, but it's the way it's managed and the mismanagement by the government at the time of the drought 
and the repression that followed after the Arab Spring were the, the major contributing factors. It was not climate change driven, although there was migration. But I think this link with migration is, is interesting and potentially problematic because we tend to blame migrants to be sources of instability, sources of insecurity when actually they're the victims of climate change and also political decisions. And in the case of Syria, those communities in the Northeast uh, which migrated to the urban centers were not the ones who protested in, in 2011. They were laying low, they were very vulnerable, marginalized, they became the new urban poor, and they were not the ones able to do all of that, although they were marginalized because of the government's decisions uh, to lift the subsidies. I just want to make a point about the Euphrates and Tigris Basin. Gokshi, I think it would be worth looking into Iraq because um, in the last two summers, when the temperatures rose to 50 degrees and more, a lot of the rural communities in Iraq, in the Tigris Basin, and because of also uh, Turkey's um, um, capture of the waters upstream on the Tigris River, had to migrate. And we don't know the numbers, you're right, it's speculative, but we know there were whole communities, and this is an ongoing uh, research issue and also a human insecurity issue on the ground that is worth uh, looking into. Marissa? <laughs> no, I just wanted to make sure there's no online um, questions. Um, so, uh, Gocha, you um, cited the lack of data and the importance of transparency, scientific transparency, when it comes to this data. Um, and in conflict settings, when these issues are highly politicized <clears throat> and these resources that we know are scarce are also, as Marwa mentioned and others, highly weaponized, um, how do you navigate um, the, the data challenge? You know, where, where does that come from? Like, do, do, you, do you have UN agencies or UN bodies that, uh, that go in to fill that gap? Um, if, if some of this data is already being done by, you know, um, by governments or by local authorities, but the data itself is being hogged for their own purposes, how do you go past that? Because that seems to be a starting point even to start building trust. Because I'm thinking if the scientific community would come together to share data, then you are empowered to make better projections about how these types of policies will impact you as a single country in the future. And I wonder if this is one way to start the conversation around trust building through data. But, I, but, but, but I'm just wondering, what is the entry point to actually expand that uh, platform to have more data that is shareable? That is a very good question. And it is uh, a bit of a you know chicken and egg question too, because uh, to be able to share data, countries want to trust each other first, that it's not going to be weaponized. But for trust, there also needs to be some objective um, points from which you know countries can build a basis of negotiations. Um, I would say one thing could be a citizen science, uh, which has been going on in Turkey for some time, you know, like people trying to collect samples from their local supplies in other contexts, not necessarily based on the Euphrates Tigris Basin. Uh, and I'm sure I haven't really looked into it, but I'm sure similar efforts have been taking place in other countries too, like Syria and Iraq, possibly. Um, citizen science can be one starting point of how there can be more transparency around, you know, how much water there is out there. Is the water polluted? What could be the source of pollution? Um, and also third neutral, third neutral organizations like the United Nations possibly. I am not sure how that would happen because I can't imagine a UN agent you know, coming to Turkey being like, I'm going to uh, measure your water volumes and the government of Turkey being okay with that under the current circumstances. Uh, what could happen is at least sharing some starting with sharing some data such as rain and snowfall um, to at least understand the meteorologic conditions because that is that can also be obtained through you know other means of other kind of satellite data um, so maybe starting with semi-public information that is already kind of out there 
and starting with um, the scientific literature that has done its own like measuring, you know, like other papers that kind of estimated the flows over the years could be one starting point, but it is a challenge and it is very difficult to convince a country when they think the data is so valuable and it's a matter of national security, which is how data is sometimes framed in the basin. It's, it's a matter of national security. A country doesn't usually share its national security matters with the other countries unless there's a lot of trust. So that is one challenge. That's Thank a, you. It's a great question. And that was a, a really nice response, Gokche. I think that focus on citizen science is really important. And there's numerous examples of where, you know, seemingly intractable, intractable uh, conflicts between countries, you've still had managed to have the scientific community being. There, right, and that that becomes a really important entry point for broader cooperation, and we're seeing also how that can be disrupted, like in the polar regions with uh, sort of Arctic science and understanding climate impacts, um, and the Russia conflict in Ukraine. That you know, just not being able to connect with Russian science is really impacting our understanding of what's happening in the polar region. So that is a very important point. Um, I know we're at the end of our time. I think what I'd like to do. There's a question online, and I like. I like all of the questions. There's This is not a hierarchy of questions. But I think it's a nice question to end on. And so I'll ask it, and then we'll just go around the room for responses. And then, Natalie, why don't we start with you? Um, so one, it's, the question is around how we can connect investment with local organizations and sort of local perceptions of risks and opportunities um, for more effective responses. So are there organizations on the ground that have the ability to implement and manage these transitions effectively? And, and what can we do to sort of help elevate those organizations and these kinds of investments? So not a particular sector approach, but like through your research and what you're focused on, are there organizations that you would point to as having sort of innovative uh, responses that should be further elevated? Sure. So, um, I mean, the, the first thing for me that comes to mind is actually, as a political geographer, we always emphasize geography is everything and knowing the specific community um, and the, the geography of that region that, that you're working in is, is absolutely essential. And and also to be aware that geography is always changing. Um, and that's not just the physical geography and the issue of the water flows, but also the human geography. Uh, so there's been a big controversy that, I, that I've been uh, doing a lot of research uh, about recently about these Saudi-owned farms in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And this didn't used to be an issue when the farms were first bought in Arizona in 2014-15, and then they exploded to become a big issue uh, in 2020. 22. And so there's a huge difference in just in terms of that reception. And so I think, yes, the institutions can can always support and be, be useful actors. Um, but I'll just sort of take the easy geographer's way out, which is to say, pay attention to the geography, but also know that it's not static, that it is always changing. And where water might not be political in one moment, it will become later. So just to be um, mobile in that sense. That's a great point, the importance of foresight. <laughs> okay, we'll go online. Uh, Noor. Yes, the same question. Yes, yeah, are there, um, are there any examples or uh, organizations that you would point to as doing effective work in the space that you're focused in? Yeah, I would think uh, not specific names, uh, uh, but uh, in general, uh, what also Dr. Mawa, maybe it's, she has said, uh, Insights about, insights about this, but um, uh, the civics is again in 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 conflict situations where it's highly politicized. To avoid this again uh, is to target what my project also suggested to work around, uh, but also to provide direct investment or aid to civic society, to smaller entities, local communicate communities where they are not only very aware and it's been years that they know very, very well about adaptation methods and how to deal with their uh, environment uh, and within their uh, uh, social uh, surrounding as well. Uh, but also because they have genuine interest. They, this is their area. And in this case, we can also avoid uh, the uh, centralization of power uh, of aid and of investment when it comes to a conflict situation like in Syria. So I would say uh, that's, that's, that will do my suggestion. 
Thank you, Nora. Marwa? I think it's a very important uh, question. And um, I did research recently for a paper on the impacts of the earthquake on Northwest Syria. And one of the major recommendations we had with my co-authors, and I worked with uh, uh, Muzna Dureid, who very, was very much on the field and knew what was happening. And we noticed that after the earthquake, the, because of the bargaining process around aid and through the Syrian government, et cetera, there was no aid reaching that region for several days, if not weeks. And the actors who stepped in were the local organizations. They were the ones providing aid, providing recovery, providing relief. And so the major recommendation, and I'm talking about the White Helmets, the Syria Water Platform and others, the Syria Recovery Trust Fund that Noor mentions uh, in her paper. And it's very important uh, to rely on these local organizations rather than central governments often because they know the ground and because often there's also corruption at the central government or political decisions uh, about who gets to get what, you know, and again, not only renewable energy, but also aid. And in that sense, but again, it's part of the trust issue because the argument put forth by the international community is we don't know who's getting that aid. There might be so-called terrorists, etc. cetera, whereas we know they are the ones providing those uh, civil society services to the population. So I think there's a change and there's a debate now in the international aid community to really shift the focus rather than have big organizations, rather shift it to the local organization, especially the ones which have proved their capacity uh, in dealing with crisis situations. Thank you, Marwa. And Koche. Um, I can think of one organization that actually doesn't explicitly work on the um, exclusively work on the Euphrates Tigris Basin is um, Ecopis Middle East, which we've also heard from, like as part of the <laughs> fellowship. Um, and you know, before the conflict uh, in Gaza, actually they had a proposal for um, energy for water exchange between Jordan, Israel, and Gaza Strip, and. Uh, I'm not sure what happened with that proposal or the future of that project, but um, at some point, I think it comes down to individual entrepreneurs, individual organizations that can try to, you know, come up with solid proposals, solid plans to take to one of the governments or the other and try to basically build at least a public uh, interest in collaborative, cooperative projects that is important for, you know, human aid, human safety, water safety, um, also energy security too. Um, so projects like that, that foster a collaborative environment, um, despite what's going on at the um, higher political level can be a kind of a grounds for further cooperation. Ecopeace is a, a excellent example, and that's come from decades of really hard, intentional daily work um, at multiple levels of governance, um, from the local all the, all the way up to the regional. Um, so great example to end with. Thank you, Goche. Uh, thank you all for being with us today, and thank you for tuning in online. Thank you to our fellows and to the UAE Embassy for your support, and to Marwa and Natalie for your, for well, your many years of research that has sort of provided foundational work um, for the fellowship, and also for your comments today. Thank you. Thank and you. We'll, it was we'll, a pleasure. Yeah, more soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.